Well, this morning we're going to take a look in the life of David. Uh, we looked at David a few months ago in a standalone message after his sin with Bathsheba and his, the confrontation, the prophet Nathan, Nathan confronts him about that sin and ultimately he confesses. Well, this morning we're going to back up a little bit and look at the events that led up to that sin and the consequences that followed. Uh, David was a man after God's own heart. He, at the, the time of, of 2 Samuel 11, is the king of Israel. And he was one of the most uh, well-known figures, is one of the most well-known figures from the Bible because of all of, that he had done for the Lord and because of the fact that he's the only one that's described as being a man after God's own heart. And so we're going to look today at his life. I want to start with a question, though. What do Richard Nixon, Bill Clinton, and David all have in common? Seems like a random question, right? Well, all three of those guys entered what we're calling today the spin zone. And the spin zone, if you want to know what that is, the spin zone is whenever you enter God's no-sin zone, you're motivated by lust for power, sex, money, or, or any other... Uh, any other temptation that feeds on your desire to please yourself or to control influence, that sort of thing. You enter into the sin zone, you commit a sin, and then you really enter the spin zone when you push the button to choose to cover that sin up. And that begins a downward spiral. And all three of those guys had an experience where they could have chosen to move away from temptation, but instead they chose to cover up their sin. If you remember uh, the O'Reilly factor, which it seems he entered the spin zone himself, which is why he's not on the air anymore. He had the no spin zone. Well, God has a no sin zone. And he tells us how, not only does he tell us how to avoid entering that no sin zone, he equips us to do it if we will rely on the methods and the strength that he provides in order to avoid doing that. God has a no sin zone. When you enter it, you usually do it for the previous reasons I mentioned before, lust for power, influence, sex, money, all of those things, and you choose to cover it up. You attempt to cover it up because it never really works. We look at the biblical example here, all this began with Adam and Eve, and they, this is what happened to them. They, Eve was, was looking at the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God had said, don't eat that fruit, but it says that she saw it and it was appealing. She began to be tempted by it. And Satan tempted her by convincing her that God didn't really say what he said. He didn't really say that, but ultimately she ate the fruit because she wanted to know what God knows. She had a lust for power. She wanted to be God. And Adam, the same reason. They wanted to know what God knows. They ate the fruit, they committed the sin, and then immediately what happens? Did they run to God and beg for forgiveness? No, they attempted to cover it up. They literally attempted to cover themselves up because they were naked and ashamed suddenly. And then when God confronted them, confronted Adam, he said, who, who did this? Who convinced you to do this? Why did you do this? How did you find out that you were naked? Uh, did you eat the fruit? And then Adam says what? He says, well, the woman that you gave me convinced me to do it. He's attempting to cover up his sin. He's attempting to blame somebody else. So he enters the cover-up phase. And man has been doing it ever since. And we see a perfect example of this in our scripture today. And those three guys I mentioned, you got Nixon, who had Watergate. You had Clinton, who had Monica Gate. And you got David, who has Bathsheba Gate. And so we're going to look this morning at what led, and the reason I use those examples, those are examples from history that we remember and, and we can learn lessons from specifically David. What he didn't, what he did do, we can learn what not to do. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Lessons in 2 Samuel 11 is where we're going to look this morning. You look at David, his man, his life. You, you think about his life. You think about Goliath and you think about Bathsheba. Goliath representing his greatest victory and Bathsheba representing his greatest defeat. And we see that. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, you've got a king who is well-known, well-loved, uh, famous. He has an affair with a married lady. 
and gets her pregnant. And then in an attempt to cover up that affair, he ends up committing murder, murders her husband so that he can hide the affair. All of this, a man described as being a man after God's own heart, does this. Up until this chapter, everything that David touches turns to gold. He's got the Midas touch. At this point in 2 Samuel 11, David's been king for about 20 years. He's around 50 years old. And, And throughout this time, God's hand has been on everything that he's done. He is the nation's number one songwriter. He's the nation's number one soldier, and he's a man after God's own heart, the most well-known and well-loved man in all of the nation of Israel. So what happened? What happens to a guy, to bring a guy from being a man after God's own heart to being somebody who would do something as horrific as he's done today? Well, if you look... When you, when you look at this story, first of all, remember, you're not looking at a guy who's uh, a sexual pervert or in a midlife crisis. That's not what's happening here. When you look, though, at David as king, when God established, when he allowed the nation to have their kings, if you look in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 16 and 17, God tells these kings, he, he says three things. Don't get carried away with power. Don't get carried away with money. And don't get carried away with sex. Well, then you look at David. And you see, described about him six chapters earlier in 2 Samuel, you see that David, meanwhile, David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he came from Hebron. Think about this story. 50 years old. He's got wives coming out of his ears, more concubines than anybody else, and this has been going on for 20 years. This has been building for 20 years. There were chinks in David's armor, and we're going to learn today, again, when we're tempted, which David was, we'll see, we're going to learn what we should do by looking at what David didn't do. Some lessons this morning, some things that will help us avoid entering the spin zone. First of all, before you enter the spin zone, flee temptation. Don't try to fight it. Don't try to fight temptation. God says, run away. When you're tempted, run away. Unfortunately, David doesn't do this. Let's look at our passage today, 2 Samuel 11, verse 1. In the spring, when kings march out to war, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. David was at the wrong place at the wrong time. Where should he have been? He should have been in battle. Spring was the time that kings went out to be in battle with their soldiers. But David instead decides to stay in the palace and just lay around, lounge around and rest. And it's here that David learns all you have to do to enter the spin zone is be at the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong person doing the wrong thing. David was at the wrong place at the wrong time. He should have been out with his soldiers. Instead, he's in the palace. And that's, that's what happens to King David. Look at verse 2. One evening, David gets up from his bed. He strolls around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing, a very beautiful woman. Woman. Now listen, Bathsheba, don't look at her and say, why was she doing that? She's not doing anything wrong here. They would take these large cisterns and put them up on the roof so they could collect rainwater. And in the afternoon, that was the, warm, the, the water was at its warmest. And all the, the women would take baths during this time because men, the men weren't supposed to be anywhere around. David's not supposed to be in the palace. Men weren't supposed to be anywhere near where she was. So she's not doing anything wrong. But David, because he's in the wrong place at the wrong time, sees Bathsheba bathing. And if at that moment... David would have just walked right back into the palace and said, hey, this is wrong. I shouldn't be looking at her. If he would have done that, said, Lord, forgive me, and moved on, none of this would have ever happened. Unfortunately, that's not what he does. Look at verse 3. David sent someone to inquire about her, and he reported that this is Bathsheba, Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now think about the significance of the last part of that verse. The servant identifies her by her parents, which is what they did during that day. I would be identified as the son of Donnie Hayes. That's my dad. But he goes a step further 
He not only identifies her by her parents, but also this is the wife of Uriah the Hittite. What's he saying? He's saying, King, all due respect, but she's married. Leave her alone. He knew. I mean, remember, David, he's all the time collecting wives and concubines. So he knows what he's out to, to do here. And, he, and he, out of respect, he's saying, listen, leave her alone. She's off limits. But what does David do? David says no to all the things he should have said yes to and yes to all the things he should have said no to. And instead of turning away, once again, he's got a chance. If he stops right here, everything's okay. But he continues on. That song, you ever heard of the song, Just One Look? You've heard it, right? Just one look is all it took. Well, just one look is all it took for David to enter the spin zone and go from triumph to defeat. Look at verse 4. David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to him, he slept with her. Now she had just been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Afterwards, she returned home. So how did this happen so quickly? How does David go from being a man after God's own heart to being an adulterer? Well, again, this didn't happen overnight. This event was the culmination of what's been going on in David's life for the past 20 years. All those wives, all those concubines. He's feeding this lust that he has. And this is the capstone, this event, this adulterous affair is the capstone of everything that's been happening in his life, in this area of his life, for 20 years. And you just look at this, and you see all that David's done, and you want to scream, David, stop, don't do this. Because we see the consequences, don't we? But in that moment, and here's the thing about sin, temptation, rather, when being tempted, in that moment, we don't see the consequences. David doesn't see the consequences. He doesn't see that it's going to cost him the lives of four of his future children, that it's going to cost the lives of soldiers, not just Uriah, but other soldiers, that it's going to cost him seeing his kingdom divided. He doesn't see all of that. All he sees is Bathsheba, and he can't resist because Satan is so very good at making sin look so appealing that we ignore, completely ignore the consequences. There's a verse that speaks directly to this in James chapter 1, verse 14. Each person is tempted when he's drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. That word enticed is an interesting word. It's actually a hunting or a fishing term. And what it means is to use bait to draw an animal away from its retreat. And if you're a fisherman, you know that when you go fishing, you don't use just a, a, a plain hook, right? I mean, you're going to put something on the hook to make it enticing to the fish. What do you usually put on the hook? I mean, you, a lot of things, but, you know, if you're just, just for the purpose of my illustration, you're going to use a worm, okay? So let's see. We've got a worm. I've got a worm here. As soon as I can get them out. Because, again, the fish, if you just put the hook in the water, the fish probably isn't going to go for it. So we're going to take a nice, big, sour gummy worm. <laughs> we'll see if we can't make this look enticing, all right? So, again, we're not using just plain, plain hook. We're using the worm. If I can get untangled here. So how about it? You guys enticed? <laughs> Students? Anybody want to take a bite? Timmy's trying to figure out how he can get to the bag over here because he loves these things. That's what Satan does, right? He says, come on, take a bite. It looks good. And, and the idea is that you can't see the hook. All you see is the worm. And that's how you get the fish, right? But once the fish sinks his, doesn't have teeth usually, but once he takes a bite, he's done for, right? You hook him, he's done for. Now, some of us, though, are a little bit wiser than this. And whatever Satan tempts us with, we may not take the bait. So here's what he does. He doesn't give up. Satan is very cunning. He's very deceiving. He's also very persistent. So here's what he's going to do. You don't take the worm. I wouldn't recommend anybody eat this because this is a hook that's been used before. So, But he say we don't take the bait. He doesn't give up. He says, what about this? $100 bill. No, I didn't put a hole in it. I'm not breaking the law. He says, how about now? Would anybody want to grab that? Don't try it. I'm looking over here. <laughs> not just at Caleb, everybody else. <laughs> 
That's what he does, right? He says, hey, that's not good enough. How about this? How about money? How about power? How about influence? How about sex? Whatever it is that you struggle with, alcohol, drugs, whatever it is. And see, the thing about it is he's going to keep on and keep on. And if that doesn't get you, say you don't struggle with money, he's going to use something else. And usually for us, I don't know about you. I'm taking my $100 bill back. (laughs) I don't know about you, but for me, it seems like it's not just one thing. It's all of those things. All those temptations from day to day. You turn on your television, you turn on the radio, you get on the internet, and you're bombarded daily with temptations, one after the other. Because Satan's creative, and he knows that he can use all those things. Listen, all those things can be great things. We use technology. I use technology all the time. But he knows that as good as it can be, that's a whole new world that he can open up and use to tempt us with several different things. But what we have to do, and what David didn't do, is when we're tempted, whatever it is, and we've all got something, don't we? We've all got something that we struggle with. When we're tempted, don't fight, run away. It's okay to run. That's what God tells us to do. He says, flee. Look at 1 Corinthians six eighteen. First of all, though, when you're tempted to do wrong, if you fight, you lose, but if you run, you win. Where do I get this? 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Flee immorality, Paul says. In 2 Timothy 2, 22. Flee from youthful passions. You catch a pattern here, run away. Flee. 2 Peter 1, 14. By these, he has given us a very great and precious promises. Very great and precious promises. So that through them, you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desires. You know, there's a great philosopher, 20th century philosopher, who spoke words of wisdom that relate to this. The philosopher's name was Barney Fife. And he says, you need to nip it in the bud. And that's great advice here, right? I mean, if David would have nipped it right there, he would have been done. But unfortunately, David just kept going. One step at a time, step forward, pursuing this temptation, indulging this temptation, a weakness that had been developing for 20 years, the 20 years that he had been king. And we're going to see that it's going to lead to his greatest defeat. Second, if you want to avoid entering the spin zone, confess it, don't conceal it. Now listen, David goes on and he's thinking, hey, this is just a one night stand. I made a mistake. I'm not going to do it again. But what he doesn't realize, what he's about to realize is that a one-night stand can lead to a lifetime of misery. You know, sometimes it just takes one mistake that can lead to a lifetime of misery. I mean, go spend some time interviewing prisoners on death row, and they'll tell you. All it takes is one bad mistake, and your life can become a life of misery. And David, unfortunately, is going to learn that lesson. Verse 5, there's a knock on the door. He thinks it's all done, big mistake, won't do it again. But a knock on the door changes everything. A message from Bathsheba, verse 5, The woman conceived and sent word to inform David, I'm pregnant. Three words. And don't you know David's knees buckled? His heart began to pound in his chest. At that moment, he realized, oh, I'm in trouble. Now here again, if at this moment... If David would have stopped, confessed his sin, there still would have been consequences. But a man wouldn't have lost his life. An innocent man, other innocent men would not have lost their lives. His future children would not have lost their lives. A relationship, a marriage could have been restored. Relationships could have been restored. And ultimately, eventually, David and everybody else could have gotten on with their lives. He's got another chance here to stop and confess. Unfortunately, David chooses the other option. He chooses to conceal his sin. And this begins a downward spiral of lying, deception, and murder that would make Watergate look like a Sunday school picnic. David thinks that he can use deception to cover up his sin, but what he realizes is the deception never covers disobedience. It only makes disobedience worse. 
It snowballs. And that's exactly what happens here. Let's look at the cover-up. Let's just walk through it together. Verse 7, chapter 11, 2 Samuel. When Uriah came to him, he calls for Uriah. He says, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to bring him back. And I'm going to try to get him to have relations with his wife. So they'll think that it's there. He'll think it's his child. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the troops were doing. Uriah's out fighting like he's supposed to be. David's not. He asked how they were doing and how the war was going. Then he said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the palace with all of his master's servants. He did not go to, the, to his house. When it was reported to David, Uriah didn't go home. David questioned Uriah, haven't you just come from a journey? Why didn't you go home? Uriah answered, David, the ark, Israel, and Judah are dwelling in tents. And my master Joab and his soldiers are camping in the open field. How can I enter my house and eat and drink and sleep with my wife? As surely as you live and by your life, I will not do this. David's trying to get him again to have relations with his wife, try to cover this up. But Uriah is doing what David should have been doing. He's being faithful. He's saying, no, I've got responsibilities. I can't go home and eat and drink and be merry while my soldiers are out in the field. My fellow soldiers, the ark is out in battle. All of these guys. But David tries something else. Look at verse 12. Stay here today also, David said to Uriah. Tomorrow I'll send you back. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next. Then David invited Uriah to eat and drink with him, and David got him drunk. So he's going to try to get him drunk now. He went out in the evening to lie down with his, on his cot with his master's servants. But he didn't go home. So David says, that didn't work, so I'm going to try to get him drunk. Maybe that'll convince him to go home, be with his wife. But still doesn't work. So David goes a step further. And remember, this whole time, at any point, David could fess up, make things right, deal with the consequences, but he keeps going. Verse 14. The next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, sent it with Uriah. And the letter he wrote, put Uriah at the front of the fiercest fighting and then withdraw from him so that he struck down and he dies. This is a man after God's own heart. A man anointed by God to be king over his chosen people? How do you go from being a man after God's own heart to not just an adulterer? David's been, he's been, he's been streaming, flying down this freeway of temptation, of lust for 20 years. He makes a decision to get off the exit marked adultery, but he misses that exit and gets off at the exit marked murder. He's been feeding this. How do you go from being a man after God's own heart to a murderer? Well, you feed a temptation, a weakness, slowly but surely, without confessing, without checking yourself, without God checking you, allowing God to fix it. To, to make you clean, you feed it for 20 years. It didn't happen overnight. Look at verse 16. When Joab was besieging the city, he put Uriah in the place where he knew the best enemy soldiers were, the fiercest fighting. Then the men of the city came out and attacked Joab, and some of the men from David's soldiers fell in battle. Uriah the Hittite also died. Joab sent someone to report to David all the details of the battle. Now there's something very important that I want you to see here. Uriah wasn't the only one that died that day. There were other innocent men that should have gone home to their families, but they didn't. Why? Because David's trying to cover up his sin. You see, your sin, my sin, never hurts just me. My sin, your sin, always hurts affects other people. Your sin never hurts just you. There are other people involved. There were other people here, innocent people that should have gone home. They should have lived, but they lose their lives because David's covering up his sin. And that's why Walter Scott said, oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Because it is, it is a web and it spreads, and it grows, and it entangles many other people in your life. Your sin never hurts just you. David pushes the conceal button. It's like email or text. When you get an email, you have a choice. You can either open it or you can delete it, right? 
If it's spam or there's a virus and you open it, what happens? Well, you've got trouble. A text from somebody. You can either open it or you can delete it. Sometimes it's better to delete text, isn't it? Or at least ignore it for the time being. But once you open it, it's open. You can't go back. It's been read. Well, when you are tempted or you sin, let's say you follow through and sin, you've got, a, you've got a choice. We've all got a choice. We can either push the confess button and deal with it, receive forgiveness, or we can push the conceal button and attempt to cover it up. But oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. We create a web of mess that entangles not only us, but the people that we care about the most. That was the second mistake that David made. Cover up always costs more than confession. You know, first he attempts to fight the temptation. Instead of running away, he should have gone back in the palace, run away. But he attempts to fight it. Next, he attempts to conceal it, to cover it up, which costs more than confession. He should have just confessed it. Well, third, here's the third thing that we need to do, learning from, from David. You know, David's con confession or his cover-up didn't work too well, did it? Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about it over 3,000 years later. He attempts, but he fails. Number three, he should have sought forgiveness, but instead he shunned it. So the lesson for us is seek forgiveness, don't shun it. You know, don't try to fight temptation, run away. Don't try to cover it up, confess it. Deal with the consequences, receive forgiveness. And then when you have sin, seek forgiveness. Don't shun God's forgiveness. That's David's third mistake. There's one statement at the end of this chapter that tells us that not only was all of this unnecessary, that all of this was a complete waste of time for David to attempt any of this. And he, should have, he did know this, but he ignored it. Look at verse 26. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband Uriah had died, she mourned for him. When the time of mourning ended, David had her brought to his house. She became his wife and she bore him a son. Here's the catch. However, the Lord considered what David had done to be evil. You know, Uriah's dead. David thinks he's got it all worked out. He's covered it up. Nobody has to know. He's going to do the honorable thing and take care of his widow. Everything looks like it's all in place. Everything's good. He's fooled everybody as far as he's concerned. But what he didn't pay attention to, what he didn't realize in that moment that he should have known, is that God saw it all. And not only did he see it, this is important. God determined that this man, after his own heart, what he had done, God determined it was evil. You know, in our society today, we have computers that can store the most intimate details of your life. In the cloud, on a computer, we've got technology that can do that. We have cameras in hotel rooms that when you check in, those cameras are so precise that people can use those to determine your identity just from the camera. We have DNA that can, people can use to determine anywhere you've ever been if you leave DNA there and identify you. We have satellites that can photograph Earth with such precise, precision you can see the hairs on your head. All of that. The government, if they want to, they can intercept any phone call you make. Right? We have all of this technology. With all of this man-made technology, don't you think God knows more than that? He doesn't need cameras. He doesn't need computers. He doesn't need DNA. He doesn't need phone taps or satellites. God sees it all. There's nothing that you and I can do that we can hide from God. He sees everything, and he saw everything that David did. And not only that, he considered it evil. There's no point in covering up. You may think you've got people fooled. You may think nobody knows what you're doing. But the reality is somebody knows. And, and probably more people, other than just God, more people know than you realize. We think we're good at covering things up. And even if we are good enough to cover it up from everybody else, God sees it all. You know, Dan Rather, 
I mentioned Bill Clinton, and Dan Rather interviewed him after his affair with, with Monica Lewinsky, and, and he said, he asked him, Dan Rather asked him, why in the world would you get involved with her? And Bill Clinton said, you know, I did it just because I could. I could do it. But then he goes on in that interview, and he said something that was pretty telling, and that's something I agree with. He said, I think that's the most morally indefensible reason anybody could have, could have for doing anything when you do something just because you could. I would agree with that. But David, he did this because he could. He was the most powerful man in the land. Nobody could stop him from doing this. He did it because he could. David though could have sought forgiveness and found forgiveness because God is always willing to forgive and forget. But here's the thing. God will not forget until he forgives. David was unwilling to seek forgiveness. And as we go on through this story, we see that David's going to go an entire 12 months. If you remember when we talked about this a few months ago, we see a year passes before David finally seeks forgiveness. And David learns in that moment that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence until you get over there. And then it turns brown. You know, there's statistics. Did you know that 75 to 85 percent of men who cheat on their wives, who have an affair, 75 to 85 percent of those men end up staying with their wife after that affair? Of those who don't, who get divorced, only 15% of those men end up staying with the woman they had the marriage-wrecking affair with. You know why? Because the grass is greener on the other side of the fence until you get over there. Because you realize that's where the fertilizer is. And it stinks over there when you get there. The grass looks greener, but <laughs> no, it's not. When you get over there, you realize it smells pretty bad. And that's what David realized after all of this. He realized that none of this was worth it. If only he had sought God's forgiveness. Instead, he chooses to cover it up. He eventually recognizes the importance of seeking forgiveness. Look at the next chapter, chapter 12, a year later. We talked about this last time. David responded to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And then Nathan replied to David, the Lord has taken away your sin. You will not die. After Nathan confronts David with his sin, he finally confesses 12 months later. If only he had done that to begin with. Think about this. If only at the very beginning an innocent man wouldn't have lost his life. Other innocent soldiers would not have lost their lives. There still would have been consequences, but innocent people wouldn't have died. Four of his future children would not have died. The kingdom Maybe the kingdom would not have had to have been split. He would have had consequences, but nowhere near the consequences he faced after covering it up and ignoring it for a year. So where are you? Are you struggling with something this morning? There are a lot of different things. Internet pornography, an inappropriate relationship at work, cheating on your taxes, cheating at business, embezzling money, or maybe it's temptation, you've got a weakness, drugs, alcohol, something like that. Where are you? Do you fall into any, is there something I didn't mention? Something that when I talk about temptation, something immediately pops into your head. Well, I struggle with that, I know. That's my weakness. Because you better know your weaknesses, because I guarantee you Satan knows your weaknesses. He's going to tempt you. So where are you? Maybe you're at the beginning, all right? Those things I just mentioned. You've got a weakness for pornography, and the Internet makes it so accessible. So what do you do? You've got to set up safeguards, Internet filters. You need an accountability partner besides your spouse that will help you and hold you accountable. If you have to, get rid of your tablet. Get rid of your computer at home. I know that we have to have computers, but you don't have to have it all the time, and you don't have to use it when nobody else is around. Do whatever it takes to, to, to put up those safeguards. An inappropriate relationship at work, you need to cut it off. Don't dress, you need to dress appropriately around that person. Don't go to lunch with that person by yourself. You need to, to, to cut it off where it's at right now. Run away because don't try to fight it. You're going to end up like David. Maybe you figured out a way to take a little off the top where you work. 
Well, use that opportunity to set up financial safeguards that maybe your boss isn't aware it needs to take place. Set up safeguards. Whatever it takes, you need accountability. If you're struggling with drugs or alcohol, then you need to do whatever it takes to get help right now. Get somebody, find somebody, talk to your pastor, talk to somebody you can trust and find the help you need before your life spins out of control because it will if you don't run away, if you don't do what it takes to flee that temptation. Well, what if you're in the spin zone this morning? What if you're in the middle of an adulterous relationship? You are, you are addicted to pornography, you're addicted to drugs or alcohol, or, or you're, you're, you're stealing money or cheating on your whatever. Whatever it is, you're in the middle of it and you're sitting there today and you're hearing me talk about this and you're going, I don't know how in the world I can get out of this. Well, step number one is get on your knees and confess your sin to God. Confess it. He already knows all there is to know. He sees everything. He knows what you're doing. Even if nobody else knows, confess your sins to God. And then go to the people that have been affected by your sin and confess it to them. Get it out in the open. It's going to be hard. There are going to be consequences, but you need to confess it. You need to, to, to do whatever it takes to get it out and get forgiveness, first of all, from the Lord and then seek forgiveness from those you've hurt. And then you need to get help with whatever it is you're dealing with. Depending on what it is, that will determine the help you need. And again, if you're struggling, you don't know where to go, you can reach me anytime, day or night. Talk to your pastor. Talk to one of the other ministers. Talk to somebody that you trust in your life. But you need to get it out in the open. You need to seek forgiveness. Because when you do, you will realize, and this is the beauty of this whole thing, you fast forward, yeah, there were consequences, but Nathan told David, your sins are forgiven, you will not die. When you seek God for God's forgiveness, you realize that God specializes in forgiveness. That's why he sent Jesus to the cross. So where are you at this morning? What is it that God is convicting you of? Is there something you're struggling with? Either at the beginning or in, you're, you're in the middle of your life is spinning out of control. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter how deep you are. You can be forgiven today and you can get out of the spin zone. God can forgive you. He can set you free, but you have to come to him. Let's just take a moment and bow our heads for just a, a few moments. Now, some of you are struggling with something today, and I don't have to know what that is. None of my business, maybe. But you need to seek forgiveness from the Lord. You need to let him deal with your heart. And you need to accept the forgiveness and the consequences. But by his power and strength, you can endure. But all of us, listen, hear me, all of us, we all have weaknesses. And even if you're not struggling with something, even if you're not in the middle of some sin, we all need to take the advice to learn from David's mistakes. We have to guard ourselves. We have to protect ourselves by the armor of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. God gives us a way to flee temptation. He gives us a way to not just resist, but to overcome sin with his forgiveness and his strength and his mercy. And we all, the lesson today is we need to do whatever it takes to protect ourselves from Satan's attacks and temptation. Whatever it takes. Wherever you're at this morning, you just allow the Lord to show you what you need to do to avoid entering his no sin zone. Father, we thank you that you give us forgiveness through your son, Jesus Christ. That even if we commit a horrible sin in our eyes, it's all sin to you. But even if we commit a horrible act like David did, there's still forgiveness that can be found through the death of your son, Jesus Christ, and his resurrection. Lord, we can have salvation through him and him alone. Our lives can be saved. We can be saved and set free from sin. Lord, I pray that, that if there's somebody here today struggling with sin, dealing with something in their lives, they're, tempted, they're being tempted, or they're in the middle of the spin zone and they don't know how to get out, that, that whatever it is, that they would begin by coming to you in this time and, and asking for your forgiveness, confessing that sin to you and seeking your forgiveness so that they can realize, as David did, that you specialize in forgiveness, that you're eager to offer, that you're willing to forgive and forget, but that you won't forget until you forgive. And we have to seek that forgiveness. 
Lord, whatever else, if there are others, the rest of us, who maybe we're not in the middle of some sin. I mean, we all have sin in our lives, but there's not something that we're in the middle of. But we know that we need to protect ourselves, that we need to to put up guards in our lives. And and those guardrails are found in your word, the principles that you set, the rules that you've set to protect us. And the only way we can follow those rules is if we submit to you daily and depend completely on your power and your strength. Lord, I pray that we would do that now, that we would just submit to you, that we would rely on you not just today, but every day, that every day would be a day of commitment and surrender to your will, your way, and that we would depend on you completely, your strength and your power, your provisions. Lord, whatever you would call us to, maybe you're calling some to give their lives to you. They're, they're in the middle of the spin zone. They don't know how to get out because they don't know you. And they need to accept the forgiveness that only you can offer. And I pray that that's the case that they would come today during this time of commitment. There may be other decisions that need to be made. Church membership, baptism, whatever it is. Lord, I pray that we would hear your voice in this moment clearly and respond to it obediently. Because we realize that if, even if we hesitate... That's just disobedience. We want to obey you. We want to be faithful. We want to experience your blessings in our life. And I pray that we would do that now. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand for our time of commitment?